thank you very much all of you for coming to this uh, first uh, seminar of the of the cycle seminars that we will have here at the fiscal chemistry department um, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Volte Gavelda to all of you. Uh, Dr. Gavelda is a uh, PhD in physics. He is his PhD at the Polytechnic University in Lausanne, um, working with uh, ultrafast spectroscopy uh, to study the chemical processes. He's a well recognized uh, scientist in the field of uh, studying structural dynamics in condensed matter and more particularly in uh, transition metal complexes in the liquid phase for different and start processes for different sort of applications like for instance photocatalysis <coughs> or energy results. So after completing his PhD he moved to, to several places uh, as a postdoc. He was first uh, in Lausanne, then he was in Madrid for three years and mm -hmm. that's the reason why he speaks perfect Spanish even though he's Polish. Uh, he was working at the Institute of Optical Optics, of Optics. Of Optics yeah. in Serrano. Mm -hmm. And then from 2010 to 2019, he joined the European X-ray Free Electron Laser Facility in Hamburg. Where he was working there as a staff scientist. And uh, in the last year, he became a uh, group leader at the Femtosecond X-ray Experimental Unit. He, uh, together with other people there at the European Expert, who is uh, pioneering several techniques of, uh, for the use of uh, short X-ray pulses to understand dynamics, structural dynamics. And I think uh, from what he told me that he's going to introduce many of these uh, techniques to, to you. It's a big pleasure to Thank have you here. I want to say that from 2010-20, he's here uh, Beatriz Galindo, uh, professor at UAM, and he's associate uh, at Indiana Nano Science, but he's uh, also <laughs> part of mine. Thank you, Juan. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Juan Carlos for invitation to give this uh, seminar. Um, for me, it's a big pleasure um, because I think this this might be a, a relatively new topic for all of you, and I will try to keep it very simple. Um, I will try to show you also the basics of the techniques that we've developed over the last 20 years, because for me, this is a long journey. My PhD thesis has already started on, on, on these applications, and I will show you some very old results just to exemplify. Um, in the title, what you might uh, be less familiar with, uh, I assume chemical dynamics doesn't scare you, but why would you use and how would you use these short X-ray pulses? Uh, to study chemical dynamics, right? Maybe those of you who, who've used X-ray tubes to do diffraction or, or fluorescence measurements, you are used to, to, uh, to a continuous wave source, not really a pulse source. So I'll try to convince you that how it can be done and why is it important. To motivate my talk, I, I like to show this, uh, this slide, which I, for some reason, uh, okay, <laughs> it got stuck. Let me just see uh, what's going on. Okay, yeah, now. That's um, that's a slide which which um, underlines the importance of the structure function relationship, right? This is a, a beautiful e example, a double helix uh, structure of DNA uh, for which Watson and Crick got a Nobel Prize in 1950s. And uh, literally one of them said, if you don't understand function, study structure, right? So as a function, we understand maybe a sequence of events over time which are characterized by the structural modifications. So without being too pretentious, you could say if you really want to understand the function of something, of a, of a material, you should study the time dependent structures, right? And this, this, this part time dependent implies that we are going to use X-rays because they, they have very high spatial atomic resolution. This you know already because you know how X-rays uh, are, are important to reveal the atomic nature of, uh, of matter. But how do we implement time resolution to these studies, this is what I'm going to tell you um, about today. So the ultimate goal is, of course, to make some kind of a molecular movie where we could see um, a sequence of these structures over the time, right? This is an example that many people in the time resolved uh, uh, community are showing. This is this famous uh, bet of uh, Edward Muybridge and uh, Leland Stanford. In end of 19th century, Stanford wanted to prove that actually a galloping horse at some point lifts all the four hooves of the ground, right? You can see at some point a, 
uh, a picture where the, where the horse is literally flying. So this <clears throat> was done with a millisecond camera in, 19, in 1892. What we want to do now, of course, is uh, take a sequence of uh, a protein structure which is changing over time so we can actually assemble these uh, pictures into some sort of a movie which has a time sequence, right? So this is, uh, this is the analogy. We started more than 100 years ago with a millisecond resolution. Now we can do it with much uh, shorter resolution, temporal resolution to actually see those atomic movements in time. So if you ask yourself how fast must our camera be, as I said, to look at the galloping horse, you need a camera which has a shutter speed of about a millisecond, right? This is what I did myself in Hamburg in 2011. I visited a horse track which was just close to where I worked, and I was lucky to actually see one of these horses flying just with a normal digital camera, right? So this, this is not a problem these days, right? But if you look at a chemical reaction, if you want to see a dissociation or, or, or you want to see formation of a bond, then you know that we have to be faster than a picosecond, right? So one to the uh, 10 to the minus 12 seconds would be one picosecond. And that makes sense because if you think of uh, how fast atoms move. If you just take some value, which is close to a typical value of speed of sound, then you see that one angstrom requires about 100 femtoseconds, right? So in this short amount of time, you will see a bond allocation or movement, relative movement of two atoms for a distance of about an angstrom, right? So if we want to take a picture of these atoms moving, we naturally have to uh, go much, much below this, uh, this uh, typical shutter speed. And if you look at the time scale of, uh, of typical molecular vibrations, you also see that the frequencies that we get for, for uh, uh, diatomic molecules are also fall somewhere in, in the range between few tens or few femtoseconds to few hundreds of femtoseconds. So generally speaking, you could say <clears throat> the fundamental time scales in chemistry start already at very, very short times, right? I, uh, I, 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 and, uh, I, this box basically shows you a few uh, it spans over many orders of magnitude, right? Starting from femtoseconds, pico, nano, and microseconds, because of course the complexity of uh, atomic movements are going to increase uh, as a function of time. So if you look at vibrations, we will probably look in the femto to pico, um, fem uh, 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 femtosecond to picosecond time range. If we go to more or larger. Um, uh, atomic displacement, then we have to go to, uh, the, then the ordering goes with this, with the time axis. We want to distinguish it a little bit from even shorter events. So if you really look at the um, electronic dynamics, if you look at the, the electrons before the nuclei actually uh, react to it, you know that the Born-Oppenheimer approximation tells you that you can separate the wave function into nuclear and, and electronic part. So electrons will respond much faster before the ions actually can adapt to this new configuration. And just as a, as a remark, I found this in El País two days ago. The latest pre, uh, Premio de Fronteras del Conocimiento was given to these three researchers for actually generating these attosecond uh, pulse trains which capture the electron dynamics. But that's beyond the scope of my talk today. We are going to talk about slightly longer events. You've already seen in the, <clears throat> in the previews, those of you who actually attended once, seminar you you got a, uh, a, a an overview of uh, how these measurements can be done with this very very high temporal resolution we use generally speaking a method or uh, uh, a, a, let's say a set of techniques which are called generally uh, pump probe spectroscopy and they basically consist of using a pair of pulses short pulses uh, usually these are pulses uh, of uh, optical or infrared uh, light which are synchronized with respect to each other in such a way that one of those pulses will trigger a given process in your sample and the other one will basically interrogate um, this photo excited uh, specimen at a given time delay, right? And we can change this time delay continuously and thereby we can get the snapshots of the ongoing dynamical process, right? And if you translate this picture into the potential energy uh, uh, landscape uh, as a function of a certain uh, reaction coordinate, then what you're doing is actually you, you see the evolution of this uh, weight packet on excited state potential energy surfaces and you interrogate it with a probe pulse at a given time and thereby you can basically map out the, uh, the shape and the, and the characteristics of this potential. However, the problem comes when this system increases in size, right? So for small molecules, for very small molecules, diatomic, triatomic, 
and that was actually the reason why Ahmed Ziwell got a Nobel Prize in 99 in, for, for, uh, for the field of femtochemistry. You can establish a direct relation between the uh, transition energies and uh, the internuclear distance. However, when your system grows in size, this knowledge of molecular structure becomes inherently difficult when system gets more, more and more complex. Of course, with quantum chemistry calculations, you can remedy this to a certain extent, but how about if we try to resolve these atomic interactions beyond optical wavelengths and get directly access to, um, to the atomic positions during uh, a course of a, a chemical reaction? So you could say <clears throat> we use a similar scheme. However, we replace the, pump, the probe pulse Instead of using an optical pulse, we use an X-ray pulse, right? So the methodology is exactly the same. We trigger a chemical reaction with a laser pulse, and then we look at the evolution of the population on, on uh, going through different transition states as a function of time using X-rays, right? And there are many other alternatives. I'm not going to talk about them, but you could use, you could look, you could look at the products uh, using photoelectrons. You could look at, uh, you could use visible and infrared light as it as done. It was done in the beginning. You could, you could even use electron uh, pulses. I will limit myself to X-ray spectroscopy and X-ray scattering, in, with particular uh, emphasis on uh, on their usefulness in, in in studying chemical dynamics. So now comes the a short reminder, or maybe it's not even a reminder, but I will just try to uh, introduce you to X-ray spectroscopy, distinguishing between X-ray absorption and X-ray emission. Right. So X-ray absorption basically it's a um, it's a, it, 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 it originates from a photoelectric effect in which a photon, an X-ray photon, is absorbed by one of the electrons. But now we are not talking about core, uh, valence electrons, but core electrons. So electrons which are really close to the nucleus. And it, when, when we hit the resonance energy, when the energy of this photon is larger than the binding energy of this electron, then of course you ionize it. And this electron can probe unoccupied states which are higher in energy, closer to the ionization potential. Or if the energy is larger than the is much larger than the binding energy, the electron will have an excess of kinetic energy, and this excess of kinetic energy uh, is very important because this electron can propagate outwards from the absorbing atom. Um, simplest in a simple picture, you can imagine a spherical wave which propagates outwards to a certain distance, and if it encounters other atoms around it, you will see what the consequence. Is. At the same time, when the absorption process happens, of course, this hole this core hole which is created here is going to uh, be filled by one of the electrons which are on the higher line uh, shells. If it's, a, if it's for example, um, a 2p electron, then you're going to have 2p1s recombination, and that would lead to an emission of excess energy in form of a photon, right? So X-ray fluorescence or X-ray emission is just an X-ray photon that is emitted at slightly smaller energy than the binding energy, the, the, the energy of the incoming photon, and we call it X-ray emission or X-ray fluorescence. So in case of absorption, you see these characteristic resonances here, these peaks, which are the uh, um, characteristic energies of the core electrons, 1s, 2p uh, of different symmetries. And in case of fluorescence, uh, the same thing comes. The emitted photon will correspond to one of the emission lines. So these are very powerful techniques for doing really chemical analysis. Um, the usual thing is that you can measure these, uh, these, the absorption and emission spectra uh, using uh, the, the simplest way would be to use uh, lambert law and just do it in transmission. So you look at the absorption, um, absorption cross-section is directly proportional to the logarithm of the incoming flux divided by the transmitted flux. That's the, that's that you already know very well. And then in case of uh, X-ray absorption spectrum, which is measured looking at the fluorescence, actually the fluorescence intensity is directly proportional to the absorption cross-section. So you can, uh, if you just take into account the geometrical um, uh, factors, which I don't, I'm not going to to uh, to go into details here, you can you can basically uh, retrieve the absorption spectrum also from the fluorescence measurements. So as I said, emission and absorption spectra. Uh, in this case, this is a manganese complex. Uh, they will show you these characteristic resonances, which are related both to the electronic structure of this particular atom, but also to the geometrical structure. Uh, and then I will show you in a moment uh, how we can get the geometrical structure from from this from this spectrum. The true power of X-ray spectroscopy is you can apply it to literally any media. You don't need a long range order like in a crystal. 
You can uh, use this technique in liquids, also in solids and in gases. You can do it in situ, in operando conditions, so it's a very versatile technique. You are element specific, which in my opinion is really the true power because you're doing atomic spectroscopy in a complex that has many more atoms, but since you are in resonance always with the absorbing atoms, so if you imagine a metal complex which is surrounded by organic ligands, you're going to actually, uh, you will be element specific to that particular metal because you're going to work around the absorption edge of that particular atom. As I said, you get a, a very rich information about the electronic structure. You can get spin and oxidation states. You probe directly the unoccupied and, and occupied density of states, so basically molecular orbitals. And you can also get information about bond distances and uh, the nature of ligands, which are actually surrounding your complex. So this is a typical X-ray absorption spectrum of an iron complex. Uh, at 7,112 EV, this is where one S electron is ionized. Uh, so you need this energy to actually start to see this absorption edge, right? And then you see this characteristic uh, resonances, which are very close to the absorption edge, which has a form of a, a sort of, of a step function, right? And on top of that, you have these resonances and then some oscillatory modulations at higher energies, right? Even here, you might see a very tiny peak, which is actually below the energy where we assign the absorption edge. So in the X-ray nomenclature, we are calling this range X-ray absorption near edge structure, and that includes these small resonances, which are the pre-edges. These are the, the transitions from 1S to unoccupied orbitals below the ionization potential. So your electron, your photoelectron that is generated by an X-ray photon has enough energy to make a transition higher, but it doesn't have enough energy to actually be ionized, right? So you can, for example, see transitions 1S to, to P or S to P, but you can also see quadruple transitions like 1S to 3D, which is the case here. This is uh, formally forbidden, it's not dipole allowed. However, if the molecular structure of your complex is not central symmetric, this, uh, because of the hybridization of the orbitals, the D orbitals get a little bit of P character, and therefore you can see these small peaks as partially P uh, orbitals, and that's why 1S to P uh, uh, type of orbital is partially allowed. And that's why these pre-H peaks are very weak. Nevertheless, they are there, right? So we get all this uh, uh, very rich, there's a very rich, amount of information that you can already extract from this very uh, very limited the very short range energy spectral range around the absorption edge physically in that range your photoelectron has low kinetic energy right it has enough energy to to be ionized however if you do the calculation yourself if you if you let's say assume that the electron has an excess of 10 EV or 20 EV, and you do the calculation of the De Broglie wavelength, you will see that the wavelength of the electron is actually very large. And it means it doesn't scatter off a single atom. It scatters off many atoms which are in the vicinity of this atom. So we call this multiple scattering. And that means uh, to retrieve the geometrical arrangement of these atoms from a multiple scattering signal, it's relatively difficult. It's not impossible, but it's relatively difficult. However, if you look at this range, if you look at energies which are way above 50 electron volts, then what you will start to see in this spectra is a sort of an oscillatory pattern which is imprinted on the on the uh, on the on the variation of the of the absorption cross section, right? And now, if you if you would extract this oscillatory pattern from the spectrum and take a Fourier transform, you actually will find out that these frequencies are directly re related to the interatomic distances, right? So this is <coughs> uh, just a, a case where you have a, a distance R1, R1 and R2, which is shorter than R1, and you see how the frequency of these oscillations changes as a function of the real space distance between two atoms, right? So this part of the spectrum we, 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 we call EXAFs, extended X-ray absorption fine structure, and in this case, the photoelectron uh, wave, uh, wavelength is short enough to actually involve single scattering events between pairs of atoms, right? So the absorbing atom is shown in red and the neighboring atoms in the first coordination shell are shown in green, right? So I can now basically represent this oscillatory pattern as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sum of some periodic functions like sine functions. And I can model this data, I can retrieve from this data by Fourier transferring a pseudo radial distribution function. You can, I will show you in a moment a, 
um, an example of real data. And now what we did 20 years ago when we started uh, to get interested in that, we added a time, time access to it, right? So now imagine is that you can measure this spectrum as a function of time. You have a structure that changes. You will see uh, a change as a function of time in, the, in this frequency uh, pattern, with this oscillatory pattern that is imprinted on the spectrum, and that would be your time resolved exaps, which gives you the, the change in the ball distance. On the other hand, X-ray emission spectroscopy, this is the case where, where what we actually measure is the, the, the photon which is emitted due to the fact that you have recombination of higher line electrons with a 1s core hole, right? So the nomenclature is that if it's a 2p1s transition, it's called K alpha line. If it's 2, 3s to 1, um, 3p to 1s, it's called K beta. And if it's a valence electron that, that, that falls down onto the core level, it's called valence to core, VDC, right? This is a very low probability transition. Nevertheless, it's measurable and it's extremely valuable because in this case, the valence electrons are those that actually are uh, responsible for this recombination. So you get direct information about the chemical bonding from that, right? In our case, um, or in the early cases, the true importance of X-ray emission was that we could directly look at the spin state of different electronic states involved in dynamics. And I will show you some examples of that. Um, this is actually an example where we measured picosecond valence to core emission. These signals, just to give you a number, uh, the, the relative difference in the, in the emission intensity of K alpha and valence to core is a factor of 500 relatively. So, so it's two orders of magnitude weaker or smaller probability that you will observe this transition than that one. However, there's really uh, a lot of information that you can you can get. And what you see here is a, it's an example of a study of an iron complex which uh, which after excitation actually goes through a, a through a process of two intersystem crossings. You have you have a singlet uh, electronic state which is a charged state, and then you then you have a transition to a triplet uh, ligand field state or metal center state, and another intersystem crossing to a quintet state. Right. So you start with a with a spin equals zero, and then you go spin zero to one, one to two, right? So you have two steps where you change the spin by one. And there was a debate in, in the literature whether this spin with state really exists. And we actually managed to measure this in 2014 uh, using X-ray emission spectroscopy, where we could record a different X-ray emission spectrum at 50 femtosecond time delay, which was actually corresponding to the, to the change of spin by one, which actually proved that this state exists before the next intersystem processing comes in. And then this is a long-lived state, which has a lifetime of about a nanosecond, which was measured earlier. And just to <clears throat> conclude this part, at the same time that you are measuring your X-ray absorption spectrum, if you have enough photons, you can actually put a large detector behind your sample and record X-ray scattering, um, which is also possible in liquids. I just wanted to tell you, those of you who ever used a powder diffraction, diffractometer, right? You, you, you remember you get this characteristic device, shared rings. In case of liquids, you also get rings, but they are, they are much broader because the, you don't have a polycrystalline material, but you have completely disordered material. So you get very broad rings. But the true power of this, of, of actually scattering in liquids is that you get information about the bulk solvent around your solute, right? So if you look in the first shells of solvent which are surrounding your your solute, you get actually the solvation shell or solvation cage information, which is extremely important. <clears throat> I will skip those equations. This is just showing that you can basically extract from the data uh, from a, a, a differential X-ray scattering. You can ex extract the data about the cage, about the solvent it's alone, but also at higher scattering angles, you can actually see the atomic structure of your solute. OK, so before we proceed now, how do I get these intense and fast X-rays, right? So there are two approaches, which I think Juan would agree with me. When you do a pump probe experiment, you can do it in two ways. One of them is you use a fast detector, and that fast detector determines your temporal resolution. So in that case, you can have a long probe pulse and a fast detector. In X-ray domain, you are limited to X-ray street cameras, which are very tricky devices. Routinely, they give you a resolution of about two to 10 picoseconds. Commercial ones, at some point, we're, we're scratching the limit of uh, below a picosecond, and there are some examples on literature where people actually constructed devices with a resolution of 150 to 300 femtoseconds, but they have certain limitations. The other, the other option is 
that what we learned from the optical spectroscopy, we don't use a long pulse and a fast detector, we use a slow detector and a short pulse. Because in that case, the resolution of your experiment is limited by the cross correlation of these two pulses in your sample. So you can detect with a slow detector, but the pulses have to be very short. Now, in X-ray domain, femtosecond X-ray sources are can be done in two ways. One of them, you can uh, use a laser, intense near-infrared laser, to generate a laser plasmas. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but, um, but you can obtain pulses on the order of 100 femtoseconds, or you can generate high harmonics, right? Uh, in this way, you can you can go to, to 100 femtoseconds and even way below it to attosecond regime, as we saw by, by in the beginning. The limited wavelength tunability of these sources actually is not very suitable for spectroscopy because we need to tune the energy continuously and they have a low to moderate X-ray flux. The second option is much larger because you have to go to accelerators. And in that case, you have third generation synchrotron sources. I will show you what the synchrotron is in a moment, but then you are limited to about 100 picoseconds. There was once in the history <laughs> an attempt to generate 100 femtosecond sources, uh, pulses with these sources, but it was extremely, extremely low flux. Although we did uh, one experiment in the past, which was uh, very heroic. Uh, the option that is available since uh, about 10 years are the so-called X-ray free electron lasers. And that's what I want to show you today. So a synchrotron is a circular uh, accelerator. This is uh, Alba synchrotron in near Barcelona. <clears throat> For those of you who ever used it, I'm pretty sure you didn't uh, use it as a pulse source, you use it as a continuous wave source. But in fact, a synchrotron is filled with small um, pulses of electrons which circulate over this structure. And whenever they go through a magnetic uh, field structure, they radiate electromagnetic radiation. So actually, if you would record the train of X-rays, which are coming from such a filling pattern, you will see that they are, they are actually very densely spaced pulses of 100 picoseconds, and you can use them for, exper for experiment. That's what we did in the in the early days. In this case, we were using a, a very typical X-ray absorption or emission setup where we would use an optical pulse and this 100 picosecond uh, X-ray pulse to do kinetics, chemical kinetics. You can see the rise time of the pump probe signal is on the order of the duration of the X-ray pulse, about 100 picoseconds. And that was the early days of, these, of this research where we were basically limited in time resolution to these uh, rather longer events. Now, X-ray free electron lasers are different because they are not based on circular uh, accelerator. They use they use uh, linear accelerators, and that's what makes them relatively long. Uh, the one that I that where I worked in Hamburg had a length of three kilometers. So we are really talking about large machines, very expensive machines, and these numbers that I give you here are just to see a little bit. Uh, you know, in what range of electron energies and what range of uh, X-ray energies we are moving when we when we use these machines, you can you use very high um, energy relativistic electrons to basically generate synchrotron radiation. However, if you make these magnets, this magnet structure long enough, I will show you just uh, one brief slide in a moment. You actually can force these electrons to emit in phase, and when they start emitting in phase the radiation becomes coherent, at least spatially. Not longitudinally, but spatially. That's why <clears throat> my colleagues who are laser physicists, they say these are not real lasers because they are not fully coherent. They are coherent uh, in transverse direction, spatially, but they are not uh, longitudinally coherent. You don't have a temporal coherence uh, in those machines. In the, way, in, in, the, in, the, in the generation scheme that I, will, that I will use in this presentation. However, if you look at this graph, then the important thing here is that <clears throat> compared to the third generation synchrotrons, you have in a tremendous increase in brilliance. So the photon flux per energy interval per solid angle. So you have really uh, brilliant, we call it in X-ray physics, we call it, we have very brilliant uh, X-ray beams. Now, how does it happen? Just very briefly. <clears throat> so imagine that you have an electron, relativistic electron going through a magnetic field, right? These are the opposite magnetic poles. Uh, which go, which which change by uh, periodically. This electron will be put on a on a on a trajectory which is which is uh, sinusoidal, and <clears throat> it's going to start radiate field. And this radiation field, if you if you co-propagate electrons with a radiation field that they emitted, at some point this radiation field will start to act with the electrons which are in front. Right? Electrons move 
almost at the speed of light, but not exactly at the speed of light. That means those that are in front will catch up with the radiated field from those which are below. And that means you will have a Lorentz force uh, between them. They will interact and some of them will gain energy. Others will lose energy. So in terms of speed, some of them will be accelerated and the other will be deaccelerated. Now, <clears throat> without really going into too many details, if you do it over a long enough period of this magnetic structure, which by the way is called undulator because of this, uh, because of this trajectory, you can observe an effect which is called microbiancing, which is basically a modulation of the energy of the density of these electrons, and they will start to order in such a periodic, spatially periodic uh, bunches. These bunches are actually um, uh, separated by one, one, one ondulator wavelength. Of course, this is, this is all um, <clears throat> relativistic physics. That means uh, that you see that the periodicity of this, of this magnetic structure is a few centimeters, but because the electrons are moving at the speed of light in the laboratory framework, the radiative field actually gets Lorentz contracted by orders of magnitude. So the wavelength we actually see is not centimeters, but it's actually angstrom. So you can actually calculate very easily what is the gamma factor in your Lorentz construction contraction, which makes this radiation go down to angstrom wavelength. So this macro macrovanching means that these electrons, which are now in these stripes, are going to emit in phase. But in synchrotrons, you have completely randomly spaced electrons which do not. Uh, emit coherent radiation, they are incoherent. In case of electron lasers, you can establish the coherence because of this. So, <clears throat> is it a laser? It's not really a laser because we don't have a cavity. We have basically spontaneous emission. That's why we call them sometimes, well, not sometimes, actually, we call them SASE ATL, self amplified spontaneous emission, right? So, it's a, it's a laser that starts from noise. So, it's not a very stable laser, but if you look at the change of the power of this laser as a function of this saturation length, the, the, the length of this of this oscillator, it goes exponentially up. So this 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 actually is very similar to a to a normal laser. However, there is no temporal coherence or longitudinal coherence between these between the pulses emitted by these bunches. And as a consequence, what you get is this. You get a you have a synchrotron pulse. Oh, here I was a little bit optimistic, but if you would take a synchrotron pulse with a typical value of about a million photons, in 100 picoseconds. In XFL, you get 10 to the 12 photons in 100 femtoseconds. So that's very close to an optical laser. So we get very intense and very short radiation. Now, these days, <clears throat> you have a limited number of these machines worldwide. In Europe, we have actually a few of those, one in Italy, one in Switzerland, and, uh, and actually two of them in, in Germany. And uh, two machines are being constructed, or one is being now upgraded in the US. And in Asia, we have also uh, one in Japan, one in Korea, and one in China, which is being built. Now, this is the one I, I worked, and I will use it as an example, which is called European XFEL. It's called European XFEL because it was very expensive. It costed more than a billion euros, so Germany could not really, uh, uh, you know, they couldn't really do it on their own, so they joined into a consortium of 14 countries. Uh, Spain is one of the, con of the member states, that means <clears throat> we are actually users of this facility. This is a, a, a message that I'm not going to not going to talk a lot about. If you want to know more, we can talk about it afterwards. But it's really important that this machine is being used by us, and I I try to do it as much as I can. But uh, we should actually use it even more. Um, this is the example of a of an instrument, and one of the first instruments which was built there. This is the the instrument that I had the the pleasure to design and. And, and then put into motion. Now it's being used by users all over the world, and it actually implements <clears throat> all these spectroscopies that I mentioned to you, but it also has this large uh, 2D detector behind, so you can actually simultaneously measure uh, liquid wide-angle X-ray scattering, you can measure extra absorption, X-ray emission spectra, and uh, even X-ray runoff spectroscopy. So I'll show you some, some, so I will drink some water, and you can see actually how this thing looks like. There's a small video. This is the underground experimental hall, uh, which is in Hamburg, and there are six of these different instruments there. There's one of them that's a FXC. That's actually how it looks like. You have this <clears throat> bench on which we have lots of diagnostics and optics, but actually the true heart of this instrument is this interaction region where we have a liquid jet uh, in which we can flow uh, a given specimen. This is a 
actually uh, an iron does uh, the, the azide molecule, which I will show you the results in a moment. And in this reaction, we basically <coughs> um, induced uh, uh, ultra fast dissociation of one of the azide groups, and we could see the intermediate uh, un uh, the, 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 the intermediate structure of this complex with one ligand missing, and then we could see the reaction in which uh, acetonitrate molecule would attach to this to this uh, to this complex. Uh, and for, <clears throat> form a ball. So you see this is how you would basically convert those images at different time delays coming from the X-ray scattering, and you can you can retreat the intermediate uh, structures of this is the initial complex, and the chemical reaction is that we actually can selectively dissociate this ligand and acetonitrile would attach to it. So <clears throat> I didn't have time to drink. Okay. So now we come to science. I have OK, I'm not not so bad on time. So uh, as one said, I had to do some selection. So these are not going to be the most interesting example, not the most recent one, but at least I think I can exemplify um, a few applications. I chose a very early study on a ruthenium photosensitizer that was used by Michael Gretzel at EPFL. That's why we studied it, which was the early uh, ruthenium dye used in dye sensitized solar cell. I will show you an example of a of another uh, sensitizer, but now in, used actually in a in a photocatalytic system, which is used for water splitting. It's an iridium complex that actually um, um, acts as a photosensitizer, and the water redu uh, water reduction catalyst actually is this um, iron carbonate complex. However, in this case, it's a slow reaction because it's driven by diffusion. This is a homogeneous solution of these two of these two complexes, and they actually encounter uh, by diffusion and by collisions. You have to, you actually get this electron transfer, so this water reduction catalyst can accumulate up to four electrons to split a water molecule. I will show you an example of a very interesting molecule, which is a, a high valent iron complex, um, which you find in many biological um, uh, enzymes, for example, like cytochrome uh, P450. But the, the essence actually is that you can you can get this uh, high valent uh, iron complex um, characterized the electronic structure of this complex. And I will show you a, a few results on <clears throat> on, a, on the attempts to develop iron based photosensitizers. Right. So this is something which is, has been seen seen over the past years where people try to replace noble metals with with uh, base metals. Uh, because of course, for for applications, the noble metals are maybe not the best choice. They are academically very nice, and they they have they have uh, excited states which are extremely useful and and pro and 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 adequate to to get these charge separated states, but are not so so abundant. So this is the the very, well, one of the first experiments that I did. Uh, we looked at the charge transfer states on the, of ruthenium choose by pyridine, and <clears throat> the the photo cycle is very simple because you excite this. Single ground state to this so-called metal to ligand charge transfer state, where one of the electrons from the ruthenium 4D states is transferred to the ligand, to the bipyridine ligand. It, it can delocalize over the ligands uh, at some point. It localizes and then hops from one ligand to the other. But the essence is that <clears throat> when it undergoes this intersystem crossing from a singlet to triplet charge transfer state, it will stay there for many nanoseconds. So at room temperature and water, it stays there for 600 nanoseconds. That means you have a lot of time to put this uh, molecule in contact with something and this electron can be transferred. So Gretz cell, when he designed the disensitized solar cell, he was using these electrons to inject them into the conduction band of titanium dioxide, right? This was, a, the essence was you sensitize uh, a conduction band of a, of a semiconductor with a dye, and that's where ruthenium was really important. Now, what we did here is we basically <clears throat> were able to measure on picosecond time scale, this is 2006, um, the evolution of the LH of actually absorption spectra and at 50 picoseconds, we could actually see a very interesting thing. In the ground state, you see basically this resonance. This is a um, 2P to 4P transition. This is P, right? We have, an, we have a transition from 2P, which we ionize, and we go to these uh, orbitals. These are the EG orbitals, which are empty. So I can have a 2P to 4G for the uh, um, transition. Now imagine. The T2G orbitals are filled. There are six electrons. If I take one electron away and put it on the ligand, from the metal perspective, I have a, I have a vacancy here, so I can have a transition from 2P to 4D, but T2G. This one is a little bit lower in energy, 
And that's where I get this peak, right? So I get a splitting between these two peaks. I can measure the, the crystal field splitting between these two orbitals. That these are 4D orbitals which are uh, splitted by the octahedral field because the ligands are almost octahedral. So I have T2G, EG orbitals, and I see directly the orbital from which the electron was moved to the ligand. So I can see the occupancy of this orbital as a function of time. And actually, this lifetime agreed very well with the with the photoluminescence lifetime. So there was nothing particularly new that we learned, but what we learned is that we can selectively look at the orbitals, uh, almost like an atomic spectroscopy, <clears throat> and see the uh, occupancy of these orbitals as a function of time. Right? And that that's what we did also in the video. <clears throat> that was, as I said, this is a slightly different, different <clears throat> uh, cycle, but in the, in here what happens is that we actually excite with the, uh, iridium with optical light, it gets into an excited state in which one of the electrons from iridium goes to the ligand. So there is an uh, empty 5D orbital. Now, a sacrificial electron donor, which is uh, triethylamine, can donate an electron to this vacancy that is created on iridium. And further on, in much longer time state, this electron can be um, transferred to the water reduction catalyst, right? So again, you see an LH spectrum of iridium. Um, these are very heavy metals, so the KH is very high in energy. So we were looking at LHs, so 2p to 5d. You see the ground state, and ground state you have this one dominating resonance, which is again a transition from 2p to 5d, right? And then above the edge, you go to the continuum. Now, if I oh, if I remove the electron to the ligand again, I get a I get a vacancy here, and I get the new transition, and it's 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 really Quantitative, you can quantify what is the how many excited molecules actually um, you have in your in your uh, at your at your hundred people second time delay, and you can probe the occupancy of this orbital, so you can see exactly at what time the sacrificial donor will now donate this electron, right? So once again, ground state spectrum, and what you see here is a different spectrum, laser on minus laser off. So you see this this uh, this um, differential spectrum now. The moment I donate an electron here, I will fill in this uh, hole, so there is no possibility to have this extra transition anymore. Right? So if I, if I now, if you imagine the following, that I fix my energy here, and I, was, I will scan time, right? So I can always look at the spectra, or I can look at the kinetics. So if I do a kinetic scan, which is shown here, then you can see that in a in a iridium complex which is not in the uh, which is uh, without the triethylamine. I have a certain decay, right? This excited state has a lifetime of about 40 nanoseconds. But when I get, when I get in contact with the sacrificial donor, it's heavily quenched because I know the moment the electron is going to fill in this, uh, this vacancy, this transition is not possible anymore. So this quenching of about an order of magnitude tells you the time scale on which the electron has been transferred to the region, right? So that's another example. Now, <clears throat> this is all nice. But of course, these elements are here, <clears throat> and what we really would like to have is um, uh, a photosensitizer that is based on something more abundant on Earth, right? And this was uh, uh, this is a topic that is extremely um, explored also these days: the idea of mapping out the potential energy surface landscapes in ion complexes, right? I showed you one example uh, before. This actually corresponds to this uh, uh, molecule which is called iron trisbipyridine. This was the topic of my PhD thesis. It's a very interesting molecule because <clears throat> of the following. This molecule, uh, okay, before I show you why it's, it's interesting, um, there's one major difference which is fundamental for iron 2 complexes is that if you compare uh, the, ex the low the, 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 the energies of the excited states in these, in these complexes, both charge transfer states and the metal centered states, they usually have <clears throat> different ligand field strength, which causes that this ordering, ordering that we have in, in iridium or ruthenium complexes where the charge transfer states are the lowest energy states are now reverted. So actually, uh, at the typical ligand field strength, the NLCP states are above the uh, triplet and quintet high spin states of metal centered carbon, right? So that means that the lowest, energetically lowest excited states in iron 2 complexes are not those states where the electron is on the ligand. It's, it's back to the metal center, so it's not easy to extract this electron somewhere else, right? So as a photosensitizer, we want to have a charge separated state, we want to have a charge 
which is close to the to the away from iron and exposed to the to the to the outer part of the of the complex so we can actually translate somewhere else. <clears throat> but why I got interested into these molecules is because there is also another very interesting phenomenon which is called spin crossover. It's a very old problem, right? It's a, it's a, it's a bistability of these complexes where you can have a low spin ground state and a high spin excited state. And in, and in a classical spin crossover complex, the difference between the, the zero point energy difference between the high spin and low spin is actually on the order of thermal energy. So we can, there are beautiful studies that uh, Jose Sanchez Costa is doing at India where he produces these crystals and you can see how beautifully they change color when they go from high to low spin and you can do it in room temperature, right? So that was known very well at, in, in crystals at low temperatures. You will induce this spin transition by light, by pressure, and <clears throat> there was nothing new about it. However, and that's why it's called light induced excited state spin trapping. You can trap the high spin population for many days in this high spin state, and it changes completely the optical properties and also the structure uh, of, this, of this complex. And the structure is because of the following. If you look at the ground state, right? Iron 2 complex has a, a 3D6 configuration. So we have six elect valence electrons, which are paired in the T2G or orbitals. If it's an octahedral complex, you have, a, again, T2G, EG orbitals. These are non-bonding and these are, uh, non and these are anti -bond. Now, if I go to a, a spin configuration of two, I will have four unpaired electrons. Two of, because the, the ligand field splitting gets smaller, you can actually get uh, some of these unpaired electrons on the anti-bonding orbitals, and that expands your bond, right? So as a, as a consequence of the spin change, you actually expand your iron-nitrogen bonds by 10%. So you go from two angstroms to 2.2 angstroms. So when I saw it, I thought, okay, fantastic. This is a huge structural change. We can maybe detect it with X-ray absorption spectroscopy. However, if you go to dilute systems like liquids, this um, energy difference um, in many of these complexes that you can dissolve is becoming much larger than the uh, KT, right? So it's not, uh, it's not you know, uh, in the milli electron of all the range, but it's more like fractions of EV. So you need pressure or temperature, but these are not pulsed. So we chose lasers. You can also do a laser excitation in which you excite the signal ground state into one of these charge transfer states, and then you have a cascade of uh, of uh, intersystem crossings and internal conversions before you end up in this high spin state, right? So that's what we did. The other way to show it is uh, you can ask yourself how fast this relaxation is. And, and I, I don't want to underestimate under, uh, the optical spectroscopy. Actually, all the early studies trying to address this question were done with optical power spectroscopy. And, and I think um, this was extremely useful because we could, <clears throat> we could see the time scale of the population dynamics in the system. However, what we couldn't do really is to label these excited states according to spin. The metal center states, as you may know, have extremely low cross sections in the optical domain. So the charge transfer, charge transfer states absorb very, very strongly. So you can very nicely see in the optical spectroscopy the signature of these charge transfer states, but the metal center states are difficult to see, right? This is some early studies that we did optically and without going into too many details, we could we could see the emission, early emission from these uh, charge transfer states, and you can also see that in transient absorption we have in the in the red part and in the blue part of the spectrum you get this excited state absorption, which is actually coming from a reduced bipyridine ligand. So the moment the electron is on the ligand, you can actually see it uh, by observing these two bands. But you can also see that these bands have a lifetime of about 120 femtoseconds, which makes sense, right? The, the MLCP states are uh, extremely efficiently quenched by these ligand field states, by these metal center states, and therefore the electron does not stay for long, for long on the ligand. And the whole story about iron photosensitizer is how to revert this ordering and make these states lower in energy so they actually have a longer lifetime. Okay, so this is the, the first transient structure of this high spin complex is actually what I did during my thesis. So this data is already quite old, but I think it's a very dense graph, but I will try to guide you through it. So we did several experiments. We did experiments in the picosecond time scale, and you can see the low and high spin uh, spectra over here. We use these high and low spin spectra to actually obtain these Fourier transformed radial distribution functions. So interestingly, if you look at these two peaks, 
These two peaks correspond to iron nitrogen uh, bond distance with a certain uh, width because there's some the bywater factor, there's some disorder. But you can see clearly the shift. You see how the high spin iron nitrogen bond distance shift by 0.2 angstrom. So you could really see it in real time. We tried to do this experiment at, at, at shorter time scale back then. At synchrotrons, it was nearly impossible. If you can see, uh, I think it's literally 10 data points that we had to measure in one week. Uh, because of these very long, long acquisition times. So basically, we could not see the intermediate states uh, because in absorption, we didn't have enough resolution and we were also not really sensitive to the to the spin state, right? We could see the bond elongation, so we would, we would know that our population is here because here we, we expected the bond to be elongated, but we couldn't really see the intermediate. A few years later, these experiments were repeated at Stanford uh, with people around the, the expert in, at, uh, at Stanford, which is called SCLS. And here you see exactly the same molecule, which will now measure with femtosecond X-ray pulses. And not only that they can see, this is a complex graph, but with co uh, compared to what we did back then, they actually recorded the same low spin and high spin spectra. This is the difference between laser on and laser off. And if you now try to look at these different peaks and measure the, the change of time, you see these time scales, right? You see how the bond expands in the early times, it actually is in the MSCP state, then it expands, and you can even see this nice thing oscillation, which is a true vibration of the iron nitrogen bond, right? I had a video, but I eventually decided not to show it because it was too heavy. But if you look at this paper in Nature Calm, this is an open access paper, there's a video, an animation which shows you how the vibration of the iron nitrogen bond modulates this absorption cross section. So this is not x subs because this is not spectral. This is just a kinetics. This is the time scan at one of the resonances in the X-ray spectrum. And you see the molecular wave packet propagating on, on, on these potentials. And thereby you have a you have a you have a coherent motion of iron and nitrogen atoms, which I think is really, really fantastic. And the true experiment that in, that finally managed to, to close this debate whether this triplet state is there or not was this one where we did um, X-ray emission uh, measurements using the, the, the free electron lasers in Stanford, and we could then report the different spectra of different spin states of this molecule as a function of time, right? And there's a very nice trick, is that um, when, the spin chain change, when the spin state changes from singlet to quintet, you can actually see how the line shape, this is ground state data, this is ground state emission data of an iron complex in different spin states, and you see Singlet, doublet, triplet, quintet, they all shift to higher energies and then you also get a new peak. So now imagine that you start taking differences of doublet minus singlet, triplet minus singlet, quintet minus singlet, and so on. You get exactly these difference curves. And if you compare them with the data, you see that quintet minus singlet is what show what, what agrees with the line at longer time delays, and singlet minus uh, doublet is exactly what you see at early times minutes, right? MLCT state is when I take one electron from the metal, put it on the ligand, so the spin of the metal changes by one half. There is one electron which is unpaired. So the characteristic emission is actually a tablet. So that could be resolved back then. <clears throat> and as a consequence, if you want, I can I can I can show you later some literature to those who are interested. More complex molecules started to be studied, in particular uh, in photocatalysis, uh, people study, and I also am also involved in actually part of my project here at Autonomous to look at heterometry heterometallic diets, where you look at the complexes which are, which are made of two metals, and then you transfer the electron from one metal center to another metal center, and this is then the uh, catalytic center. The difference between iridium example is that here, the uh, photosensitizer and the catalyst are, are actually linked with the rigid ligand, so this transfer is much faster, and in some cases even more, more efficient. Okay, um, now, one more thing which I wanted to show you is now, if you think about how to design such a photosensitizer, then the whole thing is this, right? How can we move into this range where, let me do it once again, right? Where I try to shift the energy of these metal center states up so that I reach the situations for iridium and ruthenium, but I'm still using an iron 2 complex, right? So there are two ways of doing it. You can do it by some intelligent ligand substitutions. I'm not a chemist by education, so this is always for me magic, how chemists know which ligands work, which don't. So, chromism also is healthy, but it's not really 
for uh, application, but legal substitution was actually the key to obtain iron two complexes and iron three complexes with carbene ligands, which allowed you to actually shift these uh, states high enough in energy that these lifetimes started to, ha to have uh, uh, extended from 100 femtoseconds to actually 100 nanoseconds. There's a paper in Science from 2019 where a group in Sweden managed to obtain at room temperature a complex with a, with a lifetime which is now only a factor uh, shorter than in, in case of ruthenium. Now, this was an early study which we did with, with Jim McCaskey from Michigan, where he had, a, where he had this complex. Uh, it, well, he knew that it's not going to be a, the best candidate for a photosensitizer, but there was something else interesting is from the chemical point of view, this complex should have a similar lifetime to iron terpiridine, uh, which would be a little bit longer than, than uh, iron shoes by pyridine. And it was showing optically a very short lifetime of about 280 picoseconds, right? So he asked us if we could uh, measure this and understand what happens, right? Is it possible that actually the energetically lowest lying state would not be a coincident, but a triplet, which would be quite uh, unusual? So what we did is basically we, we did an experiment in which we measured, these are the DFT structures from uh, for ground state, where you see the bond distances for axial and equatorial iron nitrogen ligands. And then we did a time resolved experiment, both X-ray emission, you see here K alpha um, <clears throat> measurements, and you can extrapolate the changes in the broadening and in the shift of the K alpha line. And we know that the K alpha line width is directly linearly, pro linearly proportional to the, to the spin state. So we could determine the, the spin from the K alpha emission and the spin was quinted. So we knew it cannot be the triplet state. It has to be a quintet as we expect from Tanabet Surano diagram. However, why the quintet would have such a short lifetime? And the answer came from EXA. So now I will show you the, the, the data. If you recall the X-ray spectrum a few hundreds mm -hmm. above the absorption edge, now you can really extract this oscillatory pattern from the data. And this is where you are in the range of this constructive and destructive interference because your photoelectron is propagating outwards, and in the moment it needs an electron uh, of, the, of the other atom, it will diffract. So you will have an outgoing wave and a backscattered wave, and these two waves inter interfere. So the constructive and destructive interference, a very simple equation, you will see that moment. If you use this equation, which is essentially uh, the sum of sine functions with some factors, let's not go into the details, but you can represent this constructive and destructive interference phenomenon by a sum of these as interference of these or the sum of superposition of these sine functions, and it really fits nicely the uh, this oscillatory pattern. Or if you put your transform, it, you can actually fit your pseudo radial distribution function and get the real distances, real speed distances. That's what we did here. You see the ground state and excited state. Now what you see here are amplified. We just uh, move the, the usual ways to, to not to work in energy, but in photoelectron wave vector space. You multiply it by a square or a cube. Of K just to amplify the just to amplify the oscillations at higher energies. And essentially, now imagine that you take such an oscillatory pattern, you just take the Fourier transform, you get this, right? So now you get this representation of distances of radio distribution functions for a side state and a ground state. You can fit it and get changes relative to the ground state, right? So <clears throat> I didn't want to go to detail, it's actually published. We could actually find an unusual change in the structure, which was explaining why these potentials were uh, overlapping in a slightly different way. Uh, so that, um, before I have to finish, um, so they, so then basically the lifetime was, was, was uh, much shorter. Okay, uh, actually this is a very nice example, but I'll go very quickly through it. So this was a molecule that, in which you can obtain a high valence state, five plus of iron, right? So, and you know that the, the usually the most common uh, forms of oxidations are, are ferrous and ferric, two and three plus, and these uh, high valence states of iron are actually extremely reactive, and they are very difficult to detect under biological conditions, but they are extremely important in biology because you find them in these complicated photocycles. You often find an iron with terminal oxygen or terminal nitrogen, and then they get into these uh, four plus and five plus and even six plus um, valence states. So this molecule was synthesized by uh, Peter Feringer from Bonn, University of Bonn, and he could obtain an iron 3 plus complex in solution at room temperature, which you could excite in UV or invisible, 
and you will basically see a branching between two different um, reactions. So if you excite this molecule in the B, what you do is that <clears throat> you basically dissociate this bond here, this double bond, and then the nitrogen is produced and escapes. And the terminal nitrogen will now form a triple bond with iron, so it formally oxidizes iron to five pins. If you change the wavelength, then you actually do what the video showed you. You cut the whole azide, right? So you actually dissociate this bond here, and then you have a complex with, where, where one azide is missing, and then acetonitrile or other complex molecule can actually bind to it, right? So we studied this reaction at both wavelengths, but the interesting one was actually the the one in UV, because what happens now is that if you form this uh, state here, where, where, where if you form this high valent form, you are missing N2, right? And this missing N2 has a consequence on the frequency of the vibration of this azide. So Peter, what he did back then, he was using uh, time is of infrared spectroscopy to look at the evolution of this frequency and, and uh, assuming that once this N3 changes into N, you're going to see a, a characteristic change of the frequency and he assigned to the formation of the high valent complex. And he gave it a, a time constant of about uh, 10 picoseconds, right? So that was our starting point. We wanted to see if we see the same thing, but not looking at the ligand, ligand on, this, on the other side of iron, but directly at iron, right? If I change a single bond into a triple bond, it will have a huge consequence on the on the xanes, on the nearage structure of the of the absorption of the experiment. So we actually did some simulations and we found out that in this pre-edge, in the 1s to 3d transition, once we form an iron 5 class, we should we should see an enhancement of this resonance as a function of time. Right? So these are the laser on, laser off, the difference, and here you see the zoom into this range over here where you see this peak rising and de decaying as a function of time, which is exactly the signature of the formation of the triple bond. And if you now stop the energy, if you stop your monochromatic energy here and scan time, then you actually find the following. You see that the appearance of iron 5 is extremely fast. It's not 10 picosecond, it's 300 femtoseconds, right? So you know that infrared spectroscopy has one limitation, is that uh, you have the evolution not only of the of your excited state absorption, but you also have heating of the of the whole sample of the solvent, you have uh, broad bands, which are the narrowing. So you have a spectral, spectral evolution of the spectral, which sometimes hinder the relevant information. But here we were directly looking at the electronic structure of iron, and we could see that the formation of this high valence species, which is long lived, that's why there's no evolution after the, the initial step, is actually uh, extremely fast. I will not dwell on this decay, but that's basically the relaxation of this, of this in-plane ligand. Uh, which is detected at, at other resonances in the spectrum. OK, so <clears throat> I will maybe skip this and just tell you that when we studied this other reaction, we could actually prove that the, 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 the single bond is broken and it takes about 13 picoseconds for the acetonitrile to bind to, bind to, this, uh, to this empty site, and that was in agreement with the X-ray scattering data, right? Now X-ray scattering was extremely useful because we were we had a penta-coordinated iron complex when a citronitrile molecule gets closer. So we did simulations using molecular dynamics and uh, DFT for the solid structures where you could basically see how long does it take for this acetonitrile to get really close to iron and form or to be at the distance where you could expect actually the formation of this of this complex, right? And interestingly enough, this time scale uh, was about 12 picoseconds plus minus two. So we had, we had on one hand, we had a, a structural result which was showing that this this um, recombination with solvent takes about 12 picoseconds. On the other hand, we also noticed that um, when you have when you um, dissociate the azide, you actually it was predicted by the theory that you will change the spin of the electronic state from doublet to quartet, and that signal that we recorded in the emission actually was exactly the quartet signature. So we could see on one hand that the spin of the excited state agrees with what was predicted from the emission measurements and from the from the scattering measurements, we could prove that actually the quartet decay coincides with the time on which we associate the solvent molecule to the, to the uh, parent complex. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I want to acknowledge uh, many people who 
which which we, with whom I had the pleasure to work with over these years, and and I want to I hope I didn't forget anyone. Uh, I want to um, thank you very much for the funding, and uh, I'll stop with this picture, which was uh, actually recorded at the. I will ask the students what, why why this is blue, right? <laughs> this is the an extra beam coming from a from a tube at FXC, and uh, it gives me a very nice uh, blue fluorescence. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. I um, just have a question. Uh, when you were speaking, uh, you were talking about getting uh, the the edge region. Yes. About the edge region. What happened when you measure the fully transport? Of the edge? Yeah. Uh, it's maybe it's doing it. No, 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 it's it's um, um, OK, yeah, that, that's um, you, you don't even do this. <laughs> so so uh, um, yeah, but this this I didn't want to go into these details, but if you look at this one, so uh, <clears throat> if you see the X axis here is not energy, it's, it's K. K is basically uh, a photo photo electron wave vector momentum, right? And you see it always starts at two, it never starts at zero. Zero becomes a little bit uh, undefined because of the low photoelectron energy. You don't really, because this is a single scattering, simple uh, fitting method, which basically means you always assume that your scattering will be between this atom and that atom, or maybe there's another atom, but it always goes like single atom scattering, right? So you don't have a scattering from three or four atoms simultaneously, but you go this way, this, you can actually, you can see in the data sometimes interesting effects like uh, if you have one atom behind the other and, and this is your scattering because of because they are in a line, it sometimes enhances the scattering and so on. But since we are assuming a simple single scat single scattering events, it, everything below two two inverse angstroms doesn't make sense. So you you, you explicitly uh, exclude it, and that's why you only Fourier transform from two uh, roughly from two uh, inverse angstroms. To higher values of the momentum, right? So, because of the multiple scattering, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, the, that's why I never called the radial distribution function because it's not. It's, it's called strictly speaking a pseudo radial distribution function because it's not. Um, it doesn't truly take all the pairs into account, right? You assume that certain paths are more intense than the others, and you can see it during the fitting procedure that you can go one by one, including more coordination shells. And you start to fit this peak, and then you see this peak, that peak, and that probably is already noise, right? Because you have also high frequency noise. This high fix, this high frequency noise that you see here when you fully transform it, then you get peaks as well, right? So you have to be careful what you think is really scattering between atoms and what is just an artifact. I mean, noise, fully transform noise, right? So, so you don't transform, you don't fully transform the near edge, no. <clears throat> okay. One question. It might be the screen you can feel free to, to ask in the don't be afraid. It's just uh in your sleep minute and so I can't long yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So you took for the site firstly the sample mm -hmm. the alpha. Yes. So you don't make an electron in the well of potential mm -hmm. somewhere. Is possible that the X rays will be back on that one? I mean if you have two wells in the potentials. It's possible that the X-ray that is used as an approach has no electrons from one side to the other. And if that code can you disentangle the So there are two things. One, one thing is that um, um, since we are averaging over, so one effect would be that, as you said, the excitation process affects valence electrons, right? I excite with optical uh, wavelengths, so I do something to the valence electrons. And then I come with uh, another photon, which is, <clears throat> you know, which is not one EV, but thousands of EV, which excites one of the core electrons, right? So um, I, I, I can, of course, ionize with X-rays, right? You can damage the sample, if this is what you mean. You can do this, so you can, but I don't think there is a direct, interaction between this valence electron that you photo excited and the core electron. 
What is true is that now that we are descending into time schemes which are below a few tenths of second, what you start to observe, maybe not in, in condensed space, but in, in, a, in gas space experiments, you start to see effects when this core hole has not been filled because the core hole has a lifetime, right? I mean, uh, it has a lifetime maybe of a femtosecond or, you know, below a femtosecond. But since we are now, we are in this time range, right? You can also see uh, a core hole excited. So you can, everything what I do is I, I assume that in an ensemble, uh, there is no effect of this core hole because it's just continuously created and, and then and the combination is much faster, right? So, <clears throat> but that's one uh, side effect that one will have to take into account when we go further down in the time scales, right? Or in the temporary resolution. The direct in interaction with the valence electron, I, I, with the photo excited one, I, I, I don't know, but uh, I think there is none. Uh, what you do have to be careful is that, of course, you know, even in, the, in this in this complex, if you are resonant with iron, uh, these nitrogens and carbons they can be photoionized by the X-ray photon, right? So you can change the you can damage your sample, and and there's a that's why most of these experiments are done in a continuous flow, so that if you damage the sample, uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all you try not to do this, but if it happens, then you don't accumulate damage for the next shot and so on because you continuously refresh it, right? Um, um, I don't know if that answers your question. More or less. More or less. So my my thinking, my new concept is about like if you have something like mm -hmm. this, with the X-ray, you can you can be better to write it for the so to the ground state. Yeah. To I mean, you are perturbative, but you are you're. So the, the 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 electrons that you show me there are the valence electrons. So I don't interact with them directly, right? I I I don't excite them. They are I yeah. basically go rational with the with the X-ray yeah. of that particular transition and not with electronic transition. No, 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 no. no. Basically, the USA. So the potential I interact is the potential which is close to the nuclei, which is basically looks like a. Um, and which is which is very much localized, and I, I don't I don't interact with the potential uh, of the valence electron, right? So no. Okay, more questions. I have a curiosity. I mean sure. Curiosity. Uh, the synchronization. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has to be really tricky, to, especially when you go to to short mm -hmm. passes to, yes. to synchronize the the X-ray pass with the, the optical pass. Can yes, sure, sure. I guess you use optical delay scans, right? Like uh, yeah, you can do both. You can do electronic and 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 optical delay. So in the early days, what you would do is you would uh, synchronize the oscillator of your laser to the radio frequency of the accelerator. So then electronically, you see the, the, we were using box car gating, so you could you could synchronize the moment where your laser fires. With the moment that the X-ray pass shows up, and and you know because it was 100 picosecond, and the separation here is nanoseconds, you could electronically delay them. So you you, you basically use, use something which is called a phase shifter. You know this, right? Now, in, in X-rays, is a little bit different because there, in fact, you have to do it optically for the shortest time delays, right? So when when you really do an experiment, then you use you delay your optical pass. The interesting thing is that this this thing here, which is called gun electron gun, is a it's a photocathode which is triggered by a laser. So eventually what you do is you trigger one laser to another. The problem is that they are three kilometers away from each other, right? And that's uh, that's where Germans put a lot of effort to propagate these. Uh, they, they did optical synchronization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have, you have uh, temperature compensated fibers, kilometer long fibers, optical fibers, which transfer part of this beam, this oscillator beam, to the other end, and that is used to trigger the oscillator of the pump laser. Right. And this synchronization on a, on a, on a distance of three kilometers has 75 femtoseconds jitter. So it's, 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 it's incredible engineering work uh, that they've done, but it can be done, right? So this thing is not a thermal gun, it's an it's a, it's a optically triggered photocathode, right? Yeah. So you generate first electrons just with a laser, you can delay them. That's how it's done. More questions? 
please no. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that in front of the dean. <laughs> Because I have to teach chemistry. Uh, so, well, if you don't want to, you can also take over the lunch. So it's, uh, it's perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you for being here.